folks. Welcome to Special Interests with Bob and Donna, Donna Durasmo and Robert Banfelder. For those of you who don't know who we are, I am a retired New York City New York City educator, and Robert is a an award-winning crime thriller novelist and outdoors writer. He is a member of the New York State Outdoor Writers Association, as well as the Outdoor Writers Association of America. And we are both very proud members of the Trumansburg Fish and Game Club. He also has another very impressive credential as receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award from Who's Who in America for his fiction and nonfiction. Today we're going to be discussing the New York State death penalty, a rather serious issue, always controversial, so I'm going to leave it to Bob to start off. Okay, thank you, Donna. Of the many shows that we've done, and let's go back into time before we had our own show and before, uh, I think it was uh, with Off the Cuff, what year did we go back to on that Off the Cuff, do you recall? Oh, it's about, uh, about seven, seven or eight years ago. Okay, and then on top of that, we were given our own show, and we have another seven years on that, which we just moved away from public access uh, cable vision to YouTube. So where we were covering Nassau and County, Nassau and Suffolk County on Long Island, we're now covering the world. Okay. okay. So, um, of all the, uh, there's a reason why I mentioned these shows, a number of shows, and these were the shows that we did, they were monthly. Once in a while we would do a repeat, but for most of the times it was a new monthly show. And the point that I'm trying to posit here long-windedly is that this is the most serious show that uh, we're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I titled an article that I sent around, virtually everything that I send around gets published, but with a serious topic like this being very controversial, no one has bit yet. So I will be excerpting from this covering important points along the way. And I titled this, The Death Penalty Debacle in the State of New York. And a subtitle is called Clearing Away the Cobwebs for Comprehensive Understanding and Instilling Common Sense Solutions. So I not only make these statements, these and address these issues, these problems, but I offer solutions to so common sense solutions. So in the mid-90s, we had three penalty cases in Suffolk Criminal Court here in Riverhead. Donna mentioned the Trumansburg uh, Fish and Game Club. That's where? Central, Central New, York. New York. Okay, but we are here we, in New York. In we reside on Long Island, Riverhead, Long Island, New York, and I just want to make that clear. So, Donna, I want you to kind of share, jump, you know this stuff inside and out as well as I do. Do you recall, sure you do, what were the three death penalty cases running concurrently, simultaneously, in the mid-90s? It was uh, mid to, mid to later, later 90s, I believe. It was 97, 98, something like that. Uh, Nicholson McCoy was one person on trial. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a death penalty case. The other one was Stephen Laval. And the third one was Robert Shulman, on which uh, Bob spent 15 months as a spectator uh, covering that trial, taking notes, copious notes every day, and uh, subsequently writing a novel entitled Trace Evidence, which he has available on Amazon.com. Okay, good. Uh, Robert Shulman and his brother Barry Shulman uh, lived and at 11 Glow Lane in Hicksville. Both Robert and his brother Barry were postal workers, and Robert Shulman was um, tried and convicted of three on the island here of five um, murders 
Robert Shulman was a serial killer. And it was the first death penalty case on Long Island in approximately a quarter of a century. We had one, and we didn't, and uh, well, we'll be getting, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. So that's a, a thumbnail sketch here of Robert Shulman. Stephen Laval was um, a roofer, a, a roofer worker. from Shirley. Excuse He's me? He's a construction worker. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm homing in on, you know, You're that being very specific. Okay. <laughs> he was a roofer, construction worker, Donna, all encompassing. He was uh, the killer of a 32-year-old teacher, raped and stabbed 73 times. And before we go on to the next character here, um, do you recall who the vic this victim's father was? We used to be members of the Loyal Order of Moose, which was right down the street from us on Riverside Drive. And um, we didn't know who Cynthia Quinn was, all that we know what happened to her, and she was a teacher. Uh, but we subsequently found out that she was uh, one of the boaters that uh, we know from uh, the father, from, was, one the 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 father was one of the boaters at uh, the Loyal Order, Order of Moose Yacht Club, uh, Bill Sims. That was his daughter. So it, it hit her oh, close to home. Oh, it, it, it hit home. It, it was horrific when you know uh, the victim's family. Mm -hmm. so, so that kind of gives you a thumbnail on uh, this Stephen Laval. And we'll be talking about Steve Laval a bit later because um, Stephen Laval and that whole enchilada was the breakdown, if you will, of the death penalty. We had a death penalty and then we didn't and um, this was the case that dealt with it. Move on to the third um, character here, Nicholson McCoy. Nicholson McCoy was an informer employee of Edwards Supermarket in Medford here on Long Island. And what he did was sodomize and murder an employee at that supermarket. Um, Donna, you explain, You already explained that um, whole business with the, the victim's father, but why don't you tell them how I wound up in the courtroom initially? Uh, I did write this. I was there as a spectator, as Donna said, for every day, every working day, Monday through Friday, on this Robert Shulman serial killer trial. But I didn't go there initially with that intent. Why don't you explain, well, go back to... Uh, most of the time, the, Bob was sitting next to Andrew Smith, and Andrew gave him a little tug with the when the, the uh, proceedings uh, were stopped at some I'm going to stop you there. No, what I want you to do, and I'm sorry, I want you to explain what happened with the boat burning, how I wound up. Okay, there was a boat burning at the yacht club. Whose boat was it? Oh, it was oh, our boat. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. See, so this, is not this, this is not rehearsed. This is not rehearsed. This is not rehearsed, folks. This is, uh, <laughs> this is going back in time, and, you know, you have to forgive the age here. Okay, so we, uh, we had a boat in uh, dry docked at the, uh, the Moose uh, Yacht Club down the street, and... Um, they caught, the detectives caught the fellow that, that uh, did it, and uh, so being in the courtroom with the Robert Shulman trial, he went down the hall to, uh, to see what was going on with, the, with this uh, fellow that was um, being accused of burning, burning down our boat. Actually, actually, well, right after that, because um, I wanted to, I'm in a courtroom because I want to lay eyes on the guy who burnt our boat. And um, I learn subsequently that on deck is Robert Shulman's serial killer. And I write about serial killers. As a matter of fact, of my nine novels, eight of them 
deal with uh, serial killers. And at that time, before writing Trace Evidence, I think we were up to, I was up to number five or, or something, something like that. Like that. Yeah. Anyways, I turned to um, a clerk in the courtroom who I went to college with. And he, we know each other very well. We keep in touch with each other. And I turned to uh, my friend and I said, why didn't you tell me? You know what I write about. Why didn't you tell me who's on deck here, Robert? So he said, why don't you read the newspapers? I said, oh, touche, touche. So that's how it all started. So from that moment, uh, I was uh, present in that courtroom as a spectator for those 15 months. Okay, so let's see where we're we going here. Um, I also made it my business to look in on two other cases, the ones that Donna mentioned, Laval, Stephen Laval, and Nicholson McCoy. I went to those hearings whenever there was a break in Shulman because my main focus was on Shulman. Now, as a matter of fact, you can explain. Now I can go <laughs> into where, where I thought you were leading me. Okay. Um, Bob uh, usually sat next to Andrew Smith, an uh, excellent uh, staff writer for, for News, Newsday at the, the Robert Shulman trial. And um, Andrew gave Bob a tug and said, come follow me. And Bob said, well, I don't want to miss anything. He said, no, don't worry, you won't miss anything. So he went down the hall to... I think it was Nicholson McCoy first. Right. And here is this uh, huge man being accused Neck of uh, like this. of uh, murdering this um, grocery store uh, clerk uh, in um, in Medford. Mm -hmm. And simultaneously, was that going on at the same time with All Stephen, three. Stephen Laval? All so three. there was another courtroom with the uh, trial for Stephen Laval. So he had a trifecta going here. <laughs> Right, where Andrew Smith had the responsibility of covering. He was, he was actually uh, omnipresent. <laughs> he was covering all three, but I could focus. I could focus. And uh, it was very cool being a spectator on the Robert Shulman serial killer trial because I was privy to things that the jury was not. Uh, when there was a sidebar, the jury might be called out, or for whatever reason, uh, I could see and understand so much more than what the uh, jury could uh, gather. So, let's see. Somewheres, maybe a little point beyond midpoint, I was approached by the director of Kirby Forensic Psychiatric Center on Wards Island off Manhattan and I was asked to come in. Would I come in and not talk but lecture? And I turned to the director and I said, lecture who? And he said, psychiatrists and students. And I said to him, I almost laughed, I said, I said, you know, I learned from you guys and gals, who am I to come in and lecture before other psychiatrists, students? He said, you don't understand. He said, you've been here, let's say 12 of the 15 months, I believe it was, you've been here every day. Um, he said, I've been on a stand a few days. He says, you're coming in, if you will, and lecture. I said, to can share, I? To share I, the experiences, yeah. And I said, can I bring Donna? He says, you can bring Donna, but Donna will not get the cook's tour. Uh, in other words, of the men's facility, the uh, female facility, um, the labyrinth, the, uh, the rubber rooms, if you will, where they crash. Uh, it was quite an experience, yeah, the, and the uh, directors um, testif testifying uh, testified for the uh, prosecution because uh, Robert Shulman was sent to Kirby at one point for evaluation. So that was the content of uh, of his. Uh, right. That was the reason. Right. That was the connection, 
and uh, that facility houses a lot of bad people. <laughs> a lot of bad people. So it was kind of um, spooky. Okay. Um, the director's name was Dr. Bruce David. That was the director of Kirby Forensic Psychiatric Center. And the lecture went well, Donna was uh, there for the lecture. It was an unbelievable experience and I was truly honored to be asked, invited in to speak before psychiatrists and students uh, familiar with this case. Um, eventually, that opportunity led to another uh, opportunity. It's interesting how one thing does lead to another. Actually, I pushed for this one. I said to Donna, I said, Donna, after lecturing at Kirby Forensic, I could probably wind up with an interview with the head of Suffolk County Homicide here in Yapank. And uh, I sent letters, phone calls, a note. And then I had to back off and realize, why would this guy even speak to me? Here we're talking about the head of homicide. Well, I had joined a club out here, a hunting, fishing club, if you will, out here on Long Island. And uh, I met someone who said to me, oh, I hear you're trying to get an interview with the head of homicide. And I said, well, that, that's quite true, to no avail. And he said, well, I golf with him, and uh, I'll set up that and I'll get you that interview. And I said, oh, thank you, and I really didn't take this seriously because been there, done that, people mean well, they try to help you out, and a lot of times something like this uh, doesn't come to full fruition. Well, I'm sitting in my office den and I get a call, phone call one afternoon and I pick up the phone and, oh, this is, uh, this is Detective Lieutenant John Garrosh. And I said, yeah, and I'm wondering who's having fun with me. It was <laughs> Detective Surprise. Lieutenant John Garrosh inviting me up for an in, in for an interview. I went upstairs. Uh, well, I had to wait for about 15 or 20 minutes, busy people. And I was escorted upstairs finally, and I walk into his office, and he does one of these. I have uh, 10 minutes for you. <laughs> and 10 minutes became uh, well over an hour, as I recall, because he found me as interesting as I found him. And I had this legal pad in front of me, I believe 32 lines. Uh, to a page, and I had like three pages of questions, which he answered most of them. We couldn't talk about Robert Schulman, but we could talk peripherally about the case. And uh, that was very interesting. As a matter of fact, when I left this office, he said to me, anything I can do for you, help you down the pike, nice. you'll, you'll let me know. Very, nice. very, very nice gentleman. Um, so, I, through that interview and curb, uh, the invite to Kirby Forensic Psychiatric Center, I was able to, and you'll hear me use, uh, and if you've seen our other shows, I use this multisyllabic word endlessly, perhaps, verisimilitude. I build uh, credibility, believability, into my work. I do a tremendous amount of research. Um, toward the end of trial, I turned to Andrew Smith and I asked him, Andrew, should I write this as fiction or nonfiction? I was mulling this over for days on end and without hesitation, Andrew Smith said to me, you write it as nonfiction. Really? Write it as fiction. I'm a, write it as fiction. I, it's a non-fiction thing that you're going to write as fiction. <laughs> and I, and like it, my shoulders signal like, why? And he said to me, well, in so many words, and I'm careful with this, don't want to put words in his mouth, but it, what it boiled down to was, see, this is, this is your first uh, kind of trial here, serial killer trial, murder trial. And... Uh, 
to you, this is, you know, big, big thing here. He's, in so many words, he said, Robert Schulman is your garden variety serial killer. He picked up prostitutes in Manhattan and Queens, brought them home to Eleven Glow Lane, bludgeoned them, dismembered them. His brother Barry, who lived upstairs, did not participate in the murders, but he did help his brother dispose of bodies. Mm -hmm. Here we go with the two postal workers case. going postal. Um, so, let's see. I guess that's pretty much what I wanted to cover there, building credibility into the works. But it didn't end there. This club that I joined, that I told you about, I met someone who set up this, in, to help set up this interview uh, with uh, John, Detective Lieutenant uh, John Garage. He, uh, I, I had met another person there. As a matter of fact, after a certain period of time, this other person and myself were on probation, if you will. Uh, in other words, there's a certain amount of time uh, that you go through and then you're brought in uh, to speak before the board to see if you'll be accepted into this club. And this fellow sitting next to me had a, a bulge here. You would pick up on I that. I would pick up on that. <laughs> and I said, well, it could have been, you know, it's a hunting, fishing club. But I said, uh, let's see, what did I say? I didn't say, uh, law enforcement or no uh, i said uh, on the job or something like that and uh uh-huh <laughs> when you hear who he is you know these guys don't speak to you readily <laughs> and uh i said i pushed it a little bit and i said oh uh what capacity homicide really wow <laughs> homicide and i said nassau suffolk he said, Nassau, so now we're moving back west a bit to Nassau. Just a hell of a nice guy. We chatted, chatted for a while, and um, we, I learned that, I don't know how it came up, we're talking about, oh, he'll be, he's going to be retired soon, and he threw out a date, and the date corresponded with, uh, well, a, a birth date. And so, when is that? Oh, uh, February. February what? February 7th. I'm not making this up. I, being a little bit nuts, I pull out my wallet and I open up my driver, <laughs> show my driver's license. Look, February 7th, 19, 1943. <laughs> and he was like a year earlier, a year later. I really don't recall. But we struck up a conversation, and again, we couldn't talk about the case that he was on. I can mention it now there, but well, I'll briefly mention it. He was on his way down to arrest someone who lived in this home on Long Island, subsequently moved, mm -hmm. And the new owner came in and cleared out some barrels from the basement and opened one. And guess what he found in a one? Body. A body. And uh, it was determined later on that the woman was pregnant. She was with child, carrying a child. So, beer, building verisimilitude, building credibility, credibility, believability into my works. These were invaluable sources. So, anyhow, let's see where we'll go from here. Oh, just recently I gave a talk on serial killers. Uh, by recently, how long? A couple months ago? A few uh, months ago. A few months ago at the Preston House here in Riverhead. And I just want to give them a plug. Fantastic restaurant. If you're in the area, a little bit try pricey, it, it. well, well worth quite good. Uh, the money. Um, so... Back in 95, the New York State had a death penalty statute. 95, mid-90s. In 2004, it was vacated. It was done away with. The appellate court 
That's the highest court in the state declared the statute unconstitutional. Hence, the death penalty became invalid. It began, and we're back to Stephen Laval, mm -hmm. it began with the people versus Laval. Why did this happen? Why did the appellate court do this? Well, there are two reasons. One is ostensible, the other is actual. By ostensible, I mean seemingly so. The appellate court had you believe that this was the reason for it, and we're going to talk about the actual reason for this. We'll examine this reasoning closely. The jury had deliberated the fate of defendant Stephen Laval and decided on handing down the death penalty in lieu of, in place of, life in prison mm -hmm. without the possibility of parole. However, the appellate court killed that death penalty decision because it, and I'm going to emphasize some words here, because it felt that the jury might have imposed the death penalty on the defendant who they believed might not deserve it. But fearing that the defendant might someday be released from prison because of a parole eligibility condition set forth by the judge if a jury failed to agree unanimously. Mm -hmm. It seems that a good deal of supposition and second-guessing on the part of the appellate court wrapped around feelings, might-haves, and beliefs led to that court's decision. First off, one has to fully understand that if a jury in a capital case, in other words, a murder case, fails to agree unanimously in issuing a verdict, the presiding judge would then sentence the defendant to life imprisonment, but with parole eligibility after 20 to 25 years to life. That judge's what they call deadlock decision deadlock instruction, I should say, meaning that if a jury failed to reach a unanimous decision is what ostensibly, seemingly killed the death penalty. The flaw, and believe me, it's a flaw, the flaw had lain, had lain in the judge's deadlock instruction and should never have been written into law as it stood. We could, now this is Bob Banfelder speaking here, we could and should have a death penalty. That's my feeling, but with a lot of provisos, uh, nothing is that cut and dry with, uh, uh, with exceptions, and we're going to touch on that. We could and should have a death penalty with it being made absolutely clear to the jury that if it decides on life versus death, life in prison means life in prison without any possibility of parole whatsoever, majority rules, period. That's what I say. Forget unanimous. It's crazy, and I think you'll begin to see why. Some of you already who have made up your minds and base uh, your decisions on... Uh, serious thinking and weighing and experiencing uh, life and acquiring wisdom over your years may feel this way. Some of you may not. Coercing a jury to reach a unanimous decision is disastrous and counterproductive. The way the matter actually stands is that jurors of one mind are usually persuaded to give in to the majority simply to end 
the ordeal and return home to their families. Now I'm going to digress for a moment and I'm going to ask, put Don on a spot again, this is not rehearsed. Do you remember, well of course you remember, um, when you were in a trial and ex what happened, pretty much what I'm saying here, and you can expound on that a little bit. Well, this was back in Queens. It was a drug case on uh, far, far Rockaway. And um, we were sent to deliberate. And one of, the, uh, one of my fellow jurors was adamant at the fact that he didn't think that these kids really did what they did. What they did. Um, and the issue was the time of day. It was dark. It was it was this. It was that. It may have been raining. So he had he had his doubts. So as the day progressed, it got close to uh, quitting time, and uh, we were all sequestered. And that was an experience in itself, which I won't get into. But um, the following day, I said. This can't, I mean, this really can't go on. To me, to me and to the uh, my other, most of my other uh, fellow jurors there, it was a cut and dry except for this one guy. So being a teacher, I said, well, let's, let's role play this, <laughs> okay? So we kind of pulled, we pulled the shades, we kind of set the atmosphere, and um, we went through the um, the motions that these kids went through with the with the drug with the drug deal, et cetera, et cetera. And we we role played it, and he began to see the light. Thank goodness. So we weren't sequestered for a second night, and uh, he changed he changed his mind because he did see the flaw in his thinking. Okay, had he not seen the flaw, it would not have been a unanimous decision decision and that would have resulted in well another night of sequestering or that act or a strong uh, statement from the judge to kind of like and if it. he did not yeah. budge that would have resulted in maybe a hung jury maybe a hung jury now we're going to digress from the digression that we just did here and uh, just before we said this is not rehearsed but just before we uh, started this segment here. I said, Donna, look up this gal, this jogger who was um, attacked in Howard Beach. Howard Beach. Okay, and her name is Karina Vetrano. V-E-T-R-A-N-O. -E oh. Okay, and uh, the uh, accused is Chanel. Chanel, I believe. Lewis. Lewis. Now, what had happened, and I didn't follow that, I followed it in the newspapers, or I didn't say, I shouldn't even say follow it, I, you know, caught up and saw what happened. Uh, there was somebody, maybe one, maybe two, I don't know, I wasn't there, but there was someone who said, I'm sure said, no, uh, I'm not convinced. And I recall the reason for it now. This person or persons, probably a person, uh, I'm speculating here, um, but what I'm about to say is the gospel here. He or she felt that perhaps there was some kind of tr uh, chicanery, some kind of uh, trickery going on with the police. In other words, they uh, coerced this confession out of him and uh, out of the accused. And I'm sure they went back and forth. The judge sent them back. But guess what? Because it was not a unanimous decision, it resulted and in... It was a hung jury. It was a hung jury. And as we speak, this is going to be tried again. Yeah. Okay? That should have never happened. That should have never happened. Um, if you're familiar, I won't get into the details, but this was a vicious attack. Still. And it's uh, Christina. Karina. Karina. Karina Vitrano. Beautiful young lady. Besides Terrible. the point. Terrible. Horrible. Okay, so we could. 
and should have a death penalty, with it being made absolutely clear to the jury that if it decides on life versus death, life in prison means life in prison without any possibility of parole whatsoever. Majority rules, period. Coercing a jury to reach a unanimous decision is disastrous and counterproductive. I stated that a moment ago. The way the matter actually stands in that jurors of one mind is usually persuaded to give in to the majority. And again, why? Because I want to get home to my family. I had enough of this. Two weeks, three weeks, a month. Imagine 15 months. Imagine 15 months. Um, what I'm suggesting here, it's, is it perfect? What's perfect? It's not a perfect scenario, but I believe that it is the best that we can do under the circumstances. Change that law. Change that law. Tied to that concept, the presence of, and we've heard people speak about this, of one professional juror in ju the jury room to ensure that the evidence is being examined in a proper light and that the time is spent deliberating and not chit-chatting would be a prudent consideration. That single individual, that professional juror, would serve solely as a monitor, an officer, not offering any additional input, not trying to persuade, mm -hmm. just presenting uh, or shedding light on something where maybe one, two, or all of them are going astray here, or most, or whatever. Now, we're going to get into why we do not, why we truly do not have a death penalty and what we can do about it. Bob and Felder offers a solution or two or three. The cost of the death penalty versus life in prison without the possibility of, possibility of parole. The way the matter now stands, the cost of a new trial, if the unanimous decision cannot be reached, can be and is cost productive. That is why judges are instructed to have cost juries. prohibitive. What did I say? Productive. Productive. Pro thank you. Prohibitive. <laughs> I'm reading from notes here. I'm sorry to do this uh, because I just don't want to miss a beat here, and thanks for catching that. Um, that is why judges are instructed to have juries continue to deliberate until a unanimous decision is reached. No court wants a hung jury. No court can really afford a hung jury, especially, let's go back to Schulman and McCoy and Nicholson, three going on at the same time. Laval. Uh, Laval. Three going on at the same time, and at the same, th that's Suffolk County. We have um, others, we had others, uh, upstate New York, I believe. I believe it was another three. So imagine, let's say uh, we have six, six trials hung jury. Uh, I'm just using this as an example. A juror having to reach a sole decision in his or her mind, own mind can be trying, no pun intended, a trying experience in and of itself. Asking jurors to be of a single mind coming to a single conclusion, that is, a unanimous decision, creates a convoluted condition far greater than what the appeals court sees as being unjust in that initial deadlock instruction. To put it bluntly, the appellate division, state of New York, simply wanted to have capital offenders who were found guilty and were to receive the death penalty incarcerated 
in lieu of being executed for the rest of their natural lives, again, in lieu of execution. Why? The cost of execution versus life in prison is astronomical. Let's examine the reality. In a non-capital case, the cost to house a prisoner is $190 a day. That equals $69,350 per year. Now, let's put this inmate away. Let's say the judge says, 50 years, you're going away for 50 years. Say from age 25 to 75, you are looking at approximately $3,467,000. Statistics vary greatly from state to state. However, in a New York state capital cost, uh, case, the cost would skyrocket, skyrocket to nearly seven times more than that, sevenfold, should the death penalty be reinstated and the capital offender be slated for death row. You're beginning to see why we don't have a death penalty. We begin to see why the death penalty has been vacated. Money, dollar signs. The fact of the matter remains that it costs considerably more to execute capital offenders than it does to house them, even for many, many years. The example I gave was like 50 years. Can you believe that? It costs more to execute them. Oh, because of the appeals after appeal after appeal. Right, and generally that appeal goes on for 10 oh, years, oh, a oh. decade. Here is an excerpt listed in a report finding from the Death Penalty Information Center, acronym DPIC, Death Penalty Information Center. You're getting it from the horse's mouth. I quote, I quote from this uh, center, the greatest costs associated with the death penalty occur prior to and during trial, not in a post-conviction proceedings that goes on for, generally speaking, 10 years. Even if all post-conviction proceeding appeals were abolished, the death penalty would still be more expensive than alternative sentences. Wow. Add to the above comment the fact that the cost of the appeals process, which would normally go on for a decade, would factor out to, after all is said and done, ready for this, $23 million. Also taken from the DPIC report, and I'm quoting, the estimated cost for New York's death penalty, which was reinstated in 1995, $160 million, or approximately $23 million for each inmate sentenced to death, with no executions likely for many years. $163 million. We arrive at that dividing that 20 into 23 million, and there's your Shulman, your Laval, your McCoy, plus the others that I alluded to within the state awaiting the death penalty. Those statistics, again, were taken from the DPIC report in 2007. 2007. We're in 2019. Everything goes up. <laughs> so it is certainly a conservative figure if presented today, should the death penalty be reinstated and those capital 
offenders executed. Again, it simply costs considerably more to execute than to incarcerate a capital offender for his or her natural life in prison. Our criminal justice system does not come cheaply. We go from the time of arrest to jail. Let's jump back to Robert Shulman for a moment. To jail. He's in jail two years before he ever goes to pretrial, let alone trial. From there you go, once tried, sentencing phase, the prison time, the appeals, again, on average, 10 years, and finally, a would-be execution, the latter of which will not happen until the laws are changed. That is, the process streamlined, in other words, made simple streamlined and expedited. If a person is truly guilty of a vicious, premeditated capital crime, the execution process could and should be dramatically expedited. Now, I don't mean to be cute here, but I mean, what's the problem when we absolutely know, when we're positively sure? And I know some of you are way ahead of me, but I've given this a lot of thought, and I've touched base with this on attorneys in their office, in the courtroom, outside the courtroom, taking a positive position on the death penalty. When we positively know that a defendant accused of a murderous act or acts actually committed the crimes, guilty beyond any doubt whatsoever, not this beyond a reasonable doubt, and I often quip with, what is so reasonable about doubt? And Don, I'm going to have you jump in here. This happened recently. We were called for jury duty. And you, don't be like me, long-windedly, cut to the quick to here. The quick. <laughs> uh, what I gave the judge enough, in his we lap. Were, we were both called at the same time to, uh, to serve. And um, I have no problem serving. I enjoy it, and that's uh, a citizen's duty as far as I'm concerned. And I don't have... Uh, uh, an issue with that. But when Bob was questioned by the uh, defense attorney, uh, can you, without a, re without, uh, a reasonable doubt, uh, come, you know, get, get a convic conviction and all these other questions? And Bob was hemming and hawing about uh, what is so reasonable about doubt. So Don't mean to be judge, cute. I said that to the, the judge, judge and the lawyers. The judge Don't then read from uh, the instruction and um, because of his experiences and what he's seen with, with what goes on with the criminal justice system. And I was asked, why, Bob Banfelder, why? And I said, because we've seen, not just Bob, we've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's when the judge wanted to shut me up because I had slid in there that I worked indirectly with uh, Barry Slotnick, famed Manhattan attorney, uh, Mike Taibbi, then with CBS Channel 2 News, uh, Mark Baker, uh, Barry Slotnick's uh, associate, right-hand man, consummate lawyers. To get an uh, innocent kid out of prison. To get, I helped get an innocent mm -hmm. prison. Uh, uh, so innocent needless boy to say, he prison. wasn't accepted as a juror. But and I was, I was dismissed. I was <laughs> judge didn't want to hear home. anymore. <laughs> When we positively know that a defendant accused of a murderous act or acts actually committed the crimes, guilty beyond any doubt whatsoever, it's high time to revamp the entire capital trial and capital punishment process. Again, to streamline, to simplify the process quickly and proceed with the death penalty. 
not to drag the matter out for a decade or more. I was asked by one of the attorneys at the Schumann trial, Well, Bob, how sure do you have to be of a person's guilt? Usually I'm not quick on the uptake. I'm a writer, I'm really not a speaker. And, uh, but I had the answer like this. How sure do I have to be? Billy Keon? Billy Keon was one of the um, defense attorneys on a Robert Shulman serial kill trial. Let me throw out the names here. We had Billy Keon and Paul Gianelli, consummate defense attorneys. We had the prosecution, Georgia Tashember and Trish Brosco, consummate, consummate folks. As a matter of fact, uh, Georgia Tashember went on to become a judge. The presiding judges on a Robert Schulman serial code, the presiding judge uh, was uh, Judge Pitts. His right hand gal was Gigi Spellman, uh, uh, a savvy legal eagle uh, who went on to become a judge too. These were remarkable people. And think about it it's the first death penalty case in Nor in in uh, almost a quarter of a century, and all the players were new at this game, brand new at this game, but smart, savvy. So what was your answer? And How sure do you have to be coming back to what you were telling the people? How sure do I have? Well, why don't you tell them? How <laughs> ah, he has to be Colin Ferguson Shore, the shooter on the Long Island Railroad, and Jack, Jack Ruby, Ruby Shore. Shore. That was televised across tele television. That's how sure Bob Banfield has to be. Okay, now with um, Jack Ruby, it wasn't a horrific, vicious, premeditated, most certainly, but a vicious attack. Okay, so I wouldn't say go after the death penalty for Jack Ruby, but for Colin Ferguson, who well, I have my notes here. Kill like uh, 14 or so. Uh, see if you can help me out here, Donna. I have the numbers. I know 19 were, 19, 19, 19 were wounded. Were I wounded think six, people, six or seven people were, killed. Killed. Uh, yeah. Death penalty. I don't have a problem with it. And I'm sure because wasn't televised, of course, like Ruby, but we have scores witnesses. of people as witnesses. Colin Ferguson did this, and what a circus this became. This was unbelievable, what I was witnessing here. Okay. So, just to, I just want to follow up. Jack Ruby, in case some of you are uh, missing a beat here, he was accused, on, he was uh, viewed on national television as shooting Lee Harvey Oswald, who uh, purportedly shot John F. Kennedy, and I have my uh, theories about that. We'll go into that. that but I'm not a uh, conspiracy <laughs> uh, theorist type of guy, but uh, I have strong doubts about that. Okay. Okay, so here we go to my notes here. Uh, killed six passengers and wounded 19 aboard a Long Island Railroad. Killed six, wounded 19. Then to add insult to injury, what happens? Ferguson fires his counsel and is permitted to defend himself at taxpayer dollars, cross-examining the police who arrested him as well as the witnesses he wounded. How insane is that? How inane is that? Inane meaning stupid, insane, you know the meaning. How inane, how insane is that? Ferguson's trial proved to be bizarre, a circus of the absurd. I, uh, at the beginning of the Robert Shulman serial uh, kill trial, I wrote 
an article that appeared on a South Shore paper, do you remember? Southampton the, uh, Press. Southampton maybe. Press, about audio and uh, audio video, video, audio slash videotaping, simultaneous confessions obtained by police and provided at trial, would help to serve as erasing certain doubt in the mind of the jurors. Not an alleged confession, perhaps uh, fabricated by a homicide detective uh, of a suspect, chained to the floor in a so-called interview room, actually an 8x8 eight eight interrogation cell at police headquarters in Yapank, Suffolk County. Now, the prosecutor, the defense for Robert Shulman says that the confession was uh, coerced. I don't know. I wasn't in that interrogation room, but if this was uh, videotaped, audio taped, there would be no. Question. There would be little question because you could, you know, use chicanery, play tricks there too. But for the most part, not. If there is any question about doubt, reasonable or otherwise, I would opt for life in prison without the possibility of parole, period. And that means without the possibility of parole whatsoever, not this deadlock decision and I'm good, and uh, there's this, uh, well, you know, Maybe he'll get this out. eligibility mm -hmm. for parole. That's crazy. That's crazy. For over two decades, more than 2,000 capital offenders have been exonerated and released from prison for crimes they did not commit as a result of subsequent DNA testing. 2,000. Non, so that's... Non-capital non -capital offenders. Non-capital. Mm -hmm. So, did I not say that? You not, did not say that. I said non-capital. 2,000 non-capital non offenders. Mm -hmm. Important. 2,000 non-capital. Okay, we're not talking about, you know, serial killers here or anything like that, but talk about a lot of people. This is why Bob Banfelder says absolutely, positively, without a question of doubt, without a question of doubt. Now, listen to this next line here. More than 20 inmates on death row have been found innocent and released from prison as a result of DNA testing. Mm -hmm. Now, interest, uh, as an aside, I don't want to, you know, be boring here, bog you down with too many facts, but just as an aside here, as I am doing, as a, we were doing a show on my novel Trace Evidence, at the end, you went over to the computer and oh, you jumped in here. Oh, we received an email from one of the forensic scientists that testified on the Shulman trial. He came out of the woodwork after, what, was it, 20, 20 years? 20 years. years. <laughs> and he wanted a copy of Bob's book, Trace Evidence. He wanted it autographed and personalized. And Bob said, how, how, I'm honored. I'm honored to do that for you. He, was, uh, he, he was said, do, nice do you guy. remember me? I said, remember you <laughs> like it was yesterday. You were the third forensic uh, psych, uh, scientist. scientist to uh, testify. Uh, it's amazing. It's really amazing. Um, let's see. So, we'll go for, to what to do in the absence of the death penalty. We, we don't have a death penalty until such time as we do, hopefully, what are some things to look at? We have to have these people incarcerated. And what do we do with them in the meantime while they're incarcerated? This is going to be interesting, I think, for you. What to do now that there is no death penalty law in the state of New York, and that the majority of these inmates are to spend the rest of their natural life in prison. Let's take serial killers as an example. Now, I'm limiting, limiting this to serial killers. Um, and I research such uh, murderers, such killers extensively. And again, I had mentioned that eight of my nine novels deal with this. 
Is the answer to their murderous behavior locked away in science? Do we study them? That is long-term testing of the brain of these individuals in order, in order, genetically, biochemically, neurologically, and take cerebral spinal fluid samplings, etc., etc. Dr. Helen Morrison, I should have brought the book down here, but we have the title. Dr. Helen um, Morrison, a forensic psychiatrist and one of the country's leading experts on serial killers, believes that such testing is indeed in order. Morrison is the author of My Life Among Serial Killers for which she has personally interviewed scores of these individuals. She views serial killers as born to us, that they are a genetic anomaly. Mm -hmm. This, of course, raises the age-old discussion of... Nature versus nurture. Nature versus nurture. Let's talk about the brain a little bit. Paleopsychology is a new science which explores the application to aggression and pathological processes, the next logical, logical step in understanding human nature. There is within us a core known as the R-complex, in which are stored the, average, the uh, savage instincts of our ape-like ancestor. Ancestors. Morrison believes that serial killers cannot control themselves and feel that studies are needed as it pertains to these murders. In areas such as endocrinology, now we're going to touch on and I'll be brief here again, I don't want to bog you down with these terms, um, endocrinology, the pituitary gland, and hypothalamus. I'll just give you a brief uh, thumbnail here. In areas such as endocrinology, it's the branch of psychology, uh, psychology dealing with endocrines, that is secretions distributed by the bloodstream and glands. Study. Studies referencing the, uh, referencing the pituitary gland, a small gland in the brain. Studies of the hypothalamus, the lower part of the middle brain, which manages temperature and cardio vascular system. Uh, this is what Morrison is all about and this is where Helen Morrison is coming from. Uh, I have a different take, won't elaborate on this, but uh, we'll touch on this briefly. It might be interesting to note that Helen Morrison keeps John Wayne Gacy's brain in her home in a jar. You remember who John Wayne was Gacy? Was he the clown? He's the clown. He's a serial killer. Serial killer. Convicted. Dressed up as a clown. Dressed up as a clown. And if memory serves me correctly, don't have my notes on this one, but it's pretty much embedded, well embedded in my mind. When he was arrested, shortly after he was arrested, <laughs> they found bodies on his property buried in his home buried in the basement. What are you going to get me for? What are you going to get me? The best you're going to get me for is operating a cemetery without a license. The best you're going to get me for is operating a funeral parlor without a license. Oh. This is the... Uh, crazy. The craziness. The, you know, crazy, 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 crazy like a fox. Are serial killers sick in the mind, as Morrison believes, or are they slick? Do they deserve to die if they are truly insane? Insanity is a legal concept based on opinions. The burden of proof for an insanity defense is on the defendant. Two questions addressed by the defense must be answered in the affirmative. Did he or she know right from wrong? Did he or she know what they were doing? Serial killers are usually not found insane by those two definitions, nor are they normal. With malice aforethought, 
in other words, premeditated, serial killers first fantasize about their victims. Then they search out their victims. They study and learn all they can about their victims. They lure and or outright snatch their victims. Could be in the evening or as they get bolder, maybe even in broad daylight, challenging the police. Then they finally control and then murder their victims. They collect souvenirs and store them. Souvenirs from the victims. They go back to it and... That's the thrill. That's the thrill. Mm -hmm. Get off on it, if you will. They endure a cooling off period marked by depression. Ooh, but it's not the kind of depression that you may think about. Depression. Remorse. No. no. Not to be ma uh, made confused with any kind of remorse for their actions, but for the insatiable thirst to kill anew. To kill again and again and again. My issue with murderers, serial or otherwise, vicious murderous acts, not those occurring in the heat of passion, if you will, not occurring in that moment of madness, okay? I'm not talking about that group, if you will. I'm talking about the vicious, the serial killer, his or her viciousness, yes, and there's a there's hers in there also. There's she's in there also. Premeditated. Uh, yeah. A murder victim is deprived, and this is something that I can't get out of my brain, really. A murder victim is deprived of his or her life forever and a day, while the murderer is protected from death in New York State by the absence of the death penalty law. The murderer is living a life. Admittedly, not the life of Riley, but they are living a life. Eating, breathing, mingling, watching TV and exercise and much, much more. Uh, as a matter of fact, we did that, uh, Christina. When, what was the fellow's name? Do you have it in your head, Donna? Chanel Lewis. Chanel Lewis, very good. I have a good memory, but it's short. That's a good joke. And Karina Vetrano. And Karina Vetrano. The victim. Um, when the perp was arrested, the homicide detective said, you know, we didn't treat him badly. As a matter of fact, we put him in a cell and he was watching cartoons. We allowed him to watch <laughs> cartoons. And the victim, I'll re reiterate, it's important, is underground forever and always. Okay. I fail to see justice from this side. Looking in through a barbed window, a barred window, or it could be a barbed area, or from behind a solid wall. What I do see is a flawed criminal justice system. Bring back the death penalty and expedite, streamline the entire process. Then execute without a series of excuses. I shake my head and smile sadly at those who offer what they believe to be compelling and convincing arguments in favor of the death penalty. I have to be careful here. Often citing religious 
concepts. Religious, well, okay, okay. That's where you're coming from, and that's your opinion, okay? Um, that will be nipped in a bud if we have somebody on, say, you know, about to be uh, brought into the jury. Uh, that will be nipped in a bud by a, uh, a judge or a counselor through the uh, what the vod, what they call the vod deer, this uh, this process of uh, I would say sizing them up, yeah, okay, examining seeing the seeing where they're coming from. Um, and sometimes their argument, people coming from that arena, sometimes that argument is bolstered by our cruel and unusual punishment, meaning, you know, taking their life, the life of the serial killer. Um, cruel and unusual punishment clause is part of the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution. And I remind you, it is often very cruel and most unusual punishment such murders inflict, murders inflict upon their unwitting victims. Clear away the cobwebs, bring back the death penalty, implement concise, cogent courtroom instruction, place a professional juror in the jury room, institute a majority rules directive rather than an inane unanimous verdict return, and simplify the exorbitant appeals process and what precedes it by executing in a timely fashion those doubtlessly guilty of the atrocities they committed. I rest my case. I have a note here that tells me to go back to the top of page one. There here we go. go. <laughs> okay, getting a little heady here. Um, I either want to begin or conclude uh, as I keep sending this article around. Um, by dint of mind's eye, in other words, the power of mind's eye, I speak silently of matters that require more understanding. In contrast, upon the printed page, I voice quite loudly matters of concern that are sometimes void of common sense. Bring back the death penalty, change the laws, streamline, simplify, expedite this entire process. Thank you. Hey folks, there you have it, another segment of Special Interests with Bob and Donna on the death penalty, a very serious issue. Um, we welcome your comments and please give us a like if you uh, thought the uh, segment was informative and subscribe to our channel. We do it all. We do fishing and can I tell? Kinds, can I tell them? Sorry, you may edit this. Can I tell that? them I need a drink after this? No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway. Serious subject. Got to keep your sanity. Little yes. smile, little laugh, but yes. quite serious. Thank you for watching. Special interests in Bob and Donna, with Bob and Donna, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>